Hi, my name is Margaret, and today I'll be speaking with my friend, Sister Mary Bernadette from the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen, the CMRI congregation. And we will be speaking today how she became a sister and her experiences um, through the turmoil of the changes of Vatican II. So hello, sister. We've known each other for 15 years. 15 years now, I think oh, you that, arrived yes. here 15 years ago, yeah. but the beginning of the New England um, mission. It was 2005. We were in East Boston at the time. Can you give us a quick background on your upbringing as a child? I'm assuming that, um, you know, you're raised as a Catholic in the yes. 50s, yes. 40s, I actually and 50s. was born in Montana, uh, the city of Kalispell. And we lived in the mountains, and my mother was a, a very devout Catholic. And so we were raised with our uh, practice of the faith in the home, not to a great extent, because you, when you come from uh, North Dakota, you don't really know your religion very deeply, but nevertheless, what she did know, we, we did. And we went to Catholic school for all of the seven children. I'm in the middle of seven. Um, and dad was a blue collar worker. And uh, somehow we made it all eight years, all of us. And, uh, but mom was, a like I said, really concerned about her children being Catholic and dad did all the things that he promised to do. And we, we were just very sheltered, had a very, um, almost an idyllic life, not as the world would call it today because we weren't rich, but we had a whole mountain to ourselves. We had the, the freedom of a playground of, you know, 120 acres, really a highway down below that you could go and ride bikes on. <laughs> we were little daredevils, I guess. At, um, so at what point did your family realize that something was amiss? Did they have any um, clue of any changes um, after 1958? Well, I think you have to back up to the conservative element in our family. My father was extremely anti-communist and very well read. He, he read every night when he came home, always reading books on the situation in the world. So that's, the, that's even the late 50s. And by the 60s, of course, or what would you say, 58, when uh, the paper had the picture of John XXIII, the new pope. And I remember my dad, you know, out of the wings saying, sure doesn't look like a pope to me. And little did he know, you know, little did he know. Wow. He's kind of out of the mouth of babes in a sense. But we were, uh, um, I would say, myself particularly, of all the seven children, I connected with dad. And... Um, I would give talks in high school when we had speech class or whatever. I would always on foreign aid to communist countries or federal aid to education, those kinds of things. I remember those topics because I thought they were the most important and I was most interested in them. So becoming a conservative, I never became one. We always were. Uh, and so when things started changing back up, even before we got the Vatican II news, because most people in America, at least in our parish, we didn't talk about Vatican II. We just heard all these changes every Sunday. You know, next week when you come, there won't be any communion rail because we're supposed to move it out. Um, next week when you come, we're going to be moving a piano up to the front, whatever. It was week after week after week, and it wore down on people like us. I would have to say most of the parish just kind of smiled and thought, this is kind of exciting. I don't, I don't really know. I just know that my mother did lose all her friends, and she had many friends. But when she made the choice between Vatican II and the Catholic faith, she did lose them all for a long period of time. Maybe one came you know, dribbling back. But anyway, so I attended a little uh, day of recollection when I was a sophomore in high school. So that would be 1965. And the, uh, the priest running it was renowned from what we were told. He's a saint. He's just the closest thing to heaven. And... My sister and I were both there. The point was, within the context of his talk, he said, um, you know, young people, you really ought to pattern your lives after the example of Martin Luther King. I mean, he is the main figure of our time that represents everything that Christ wants you to be doing. And I just, I'm sure my face turned beet red. Uh, as soon as that talk was over, I left. And I, didn't, I never had the nerve to do things like my older sister did. So she had long before that gone down to the bowling alley. I wasn't the bowling alley person, but I didn't know where to go. I wasn't going to go back to his talks. I went to the bowling alley. There's my, my she says, what are you doing here? I said, what are you doing here? So We're what was happening? What was the bowling alley? It's what just was that it was a place to be. We, we lived in the country. So where do you go when you're leaving the church? You're leaving the school, you know? So we met at the bowling alley. At any rate. So at this point, um, were you in Idaho? You no, were, this is Montana. This, this is in Montana. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, that's, things are, are spewing. And it got so bad 
And I have to confess, one day I actually joined my friend at a conservative church thing, Protestant, but I thought, I can't go. They're saying terrible things there and doing terrible things, you know, making us flail our arms, singing and stuff like that and playing guitars. Those things were very distasteful to many of us. And uh, I could elaborate much more on the instances that turned me off when it came to the new nuns, the new teachings, the new books, uh, the new sermons, which were dribbled. So this was all during the 1960s, during 65, the 1960s. 60s. And your mother wasn't on board with all that. She, she, yes, she what, did, what, was, what was her reaction? Well, dad was the leader. And mom would say, yeah, dad, that's true. You know, she didn't. So how did they react to that. that? Did they continue? They would still go to church, and, but to they church. just had, every, um, every Sunday they knew that something was amiss. Uh, well, yes, it, something wasn't right, but we, you know, it's just something you didn't know what to do. You did not know what to do. So was then, there anything that made them just think, you know, what is going on here? Did, you know, were they questioning? Oh, yes, we would actually say things like, "I wonder what's going on." We'd say that, and uh, didn't know. So that now enters in because we're getting into the congregation now. I'm going to just give a little where I was and how I started the journey and how it started on the other end. So I was a senior in high school and a, a speaker. His name was Francis Schuchart. He'd made a tape called Communism in America? No way, something like that. And he's talking about the message of Fatima and how uh, people, if we don't wake up, it's going to be here. And he, he mentioned the rosary and of course, very much the message of Fatima. And uh, I was quite taken by that, which is where you also have to bring in our Blessed Mother because uh, I was just like the rest of the gang at school. I wasn't, there was no sign of somebody's going to go off and be a nun, you know? So I thought, however, that this was really imminent. 1967, January. And I went home and um, wasn't close to my mom that way. You have to understand in the 60s, we were told your parents are so outdated. You know, you, you're really not gonna learn much from them anymore because they're not with the program. And I didn't really believe that, but at the same time, I didn't have I, human respect. I don't want to be seen with my mother. But we, I decided, I said, Mom, they're going to start a little study group. Well, I want to go. So how she, did, exactly did you hear about that? That was in the talk. You can just a follow-up. You can do these little, they call them Blue Army cells. And if those of you who have never heard of the, heard of the Blue Army, it was from back in 1947. But Francis Shuckard was actually influential in starting what we call study groups which had been promulgated by Pope Pius XII in the mid fifties as a means to encourage Catholics to learn their faith better. And my mother had joined one. We were calling, kind of excited, but she only lasted about three or four weeks. She came home, I was probably seven or eight. She said, um, it's just a gossip session every time, you know, it's just women there. And that's all it turned into. So that was the end, but it was kind of a little prep for Blue Army cells. And that's what we started. There were I was the only young person. There was no one there younger than 40, I don't think. So how many anyway, people were in the cell? Oh, at least 10. Mm -hmm. And we had a meeting every Tuesday, and that went on. So here's the praying the rosary and wearing the scapular. That's all I can attribute what happened in the summer of, June of 1967. And Our Lady plays a, a crowning role in all of this, all of it. So um, wearing the scapular, praying the rosary every day. And Tuesdays rolled around like weekends used to roll around. Tuesday, just like the next day, it was Tuesday again, and we were getting in the car to, to go to our, our cell meeting. Uh, and I was given a report one week by the leader of the group. We always, they had officers. And it was on Our Lady. And uh, I still remember that because I was so struck by it. As a little 17-year-old, I'm sitting there, the pipsqueak of the, of the group. You know, I mean, who am I to even be giving a, a talk? But it was on Our Lady. And I said, you can't believe this. This is what St. Louis de Montfort says that, if you threw all the love of all the hearts of all the mothers in the world that have ever been and that will ever be, take all those mothers and put all that love into one heart for one child, that would not equal the love that our Blessed Mother has for you, for me. And I, I remember just thinking, I don't know if everyone else felt what I felt, but that's pretty big. And that's a love that you can't wonder about. It's very real. So, um, so then on the other, so I'm coming along praying the rosary and going to go to this retreat in June because it seemed like something good. And I thought I might meet a potential Catholic husband there. I really <laughs> had that thought because it's beginning so, to be a little disillusioned with all the paganism surrounding So at me. that point, you weren't thinking about a vocation no, at that point. No. When was it that um, you were 
thinking about discerning a vocation or when did you feel you had a calling? Well, actually, Margaret, I have to be honest. Since, the, since I was little, I always said this. I have to be a nun. I have to be a nun. I, that's how I thought of it. I'm sorry to say. But um, in high school years, I was able to pretty much squelch it. So I hadn't been thinking about it specifically. However, I do recall one day saying to a Protestant friend of mine, I don't think I'm going to save my soul if I don't become a sister. Wow. Now, that was, that was when I was in high school, senior year, okay. probably. But that was not the motive. In the end, it was the retreat. And at the retreat, you know, you, you have quiet time. And God has a chance again to get back in there and make sure you remember that he's been at your doorstep every day for 17 years. And, uh, but there it was like, absolutely, there's no question that this is what I'm meant to do. And I don't know where to go. The orders are all seemingly joining the modern movement. And uh, I spoke with the conductor of the retreat and he said, well, we're hoping to start a little institute of lay young ladies that can staff the Blue Army Center and uh, take private vows and have a common prayer life. It was what, what you would call the beginning of a religious institute. Very simple beginning, 16 norms, that means little rules. And they were all more interior rules. They weren't about exterior things. And since he and Brother Dennis were both uh, third order Carmelite, third order, they, uh, that was reflected a little bit in these norms that we would keep a certain spirit, um, think of ourselves as the least of the brethren, that kind of thing. So now we're at the, re the retreat and he talked to me about that. So I went home and I was home maybe, what, three weeks. He said, keep up your secretarial skills and maybe go to a community college to get, you know, keep up with things. And when we find a place, if it's God's will, if it's God's will, I'll call you. Well, it turns out that he had talked to a few other girls with the same idea. So that is how on Ju July uh, 16th, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, by the way, which I didn't know at the time, uh, we all got the phone call. And he said to me, uh, you can come in 10 days or two weeks, which would you like? I said, 10 days. I was really excited about this. This was, this was God's will. And I knew it. I knew it so solidly. That was a grace. Um, as I'm saying goodbye to my old girlfriend from, you know, from high school days, I said, I'll, I, I won't be back. I won't be back, Marilyn. She said, um, first she said, oh, when will you be coming back? I said, oh, I'm not coming back. This is forever. And she looked at me. Oh, you're crazy. You're some boy crazy. You could never last there. You, you'll be back in a month. I said, no, I won't. And I went back years later to see her. You know, we had a little visit, but it was just something that I, I knew the finality of it. And then, so on the other hand of the, the picture, how is CMRI then going to be there in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where I am going? Uh, so back up to May, the brothers, the three brothers were in Fatima. And they made a pilgrimage with a group of people, a Blue Army pilgrimage. When was that? When was that? 1967, May. Probably right around May 13th. They were probably there for that. And uh, in the, on the journey home, they ended up stopping at the Shrine of Mary Immaculate Queen in Paris and meeting the people there that heard of this little apparition that was approved by the Bishop of the Diocese. And it's the title is, is Mary Immaculate Queen of the Universe. And it's very much reflected her message in the encyclical of Pope Pius XII, which was called Ad Celi Regina. And in that encyclical, he speaks much, obviously, about the queenship. That's the title. And you could even find reflections pretty much as to what Our Lady had said in Paris. Now, that's not a publicly promulgated apparition. I only brought that up because they made a promise to Our Lady. The brothers did at that time. We are trying to move the Blue Army Center from Bellevue, Washington to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. If you wish this, and if it is the will of God, and if we can find the young ladies to staff it, having no idea how they were going to find them at that point, and be able to move the whole operation, and also find three houses to rent in Coeur d'Alene. The deadline, by the way, Blessed Mother, is August 5th. Now this was May 13th. They hadn't met anyone. It was the end of June when we showed up on the picture, and there were, like I said, there were four, four calls. Um, and, uh, and then we, were, we arrived on July 26th, and we have how many days? Added up, 10 maximum. I do remember that those were long work days and that trucks were coming in with the things from Bellevue. 
And by August 5th, there it was. Mary Immaculate Queen Center, big sign over it. Everything was in order. And the bishop had sent a delegate from Boise. I, I believe a delegate was from Boise and then one of the parish priests in Coeur d'Alene. There were two priests who came to dedicate the center to Our Lady and to a Catholic apostolate. Imagine that. So we had the complete uh, approval of the standing hierarchy in June, July of 1967, which by the way, is before the canon of the mass had been mutilated unto not being, not being valid anymore. It was before that. So uh, that was, so that's how it happened. So, we came in Ju July, right. July 26th and the brothers came later. We wrapped it all up, worked and we had, had the dedication and it all began and we had no idea. So just to clarify, so you got the approval. So you weren't set of a conscious at this point. You would no. just, you know, we were regular Catholics. And so you had the local bishop give the approval. So well, yes, yeah, Bishop so, Trinan of uh, Boise, Idaho. That was, uh, and we had it in writing. Uh, everything went, we worked hard. So at that point, it was not a set of a contest apostolate. It oh, was, no, 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 no. We didn't have any dream of that. In fact, 1967 had been declared year of faith, year of Fatima. And that was the theme of our study program that year, year of faith. They would study articles of the faith and they would study, we would study uh, articles on devotion to Mary whether it was Fatima or anything. So we were right on the bandwagon with, so to speak, with the idea that we thought was good. It would, took until October to realize this is, this is all bad fruit. So, so from August to October, what happened? What did, you, what did you experience? What kind of egregious things did you see happening in the church um, well, that made you? Well, the, the, the uh, translation of the epistles and gospels was re becoming very repugnant. It wasn't like the original very similar at all. So we were very disgusted with that. And the, uh, the sermons, it's fortunately the same. The sermons were rather um, off the wall. There was one priest- When you say off the wall, what kind of things would, and um, what can you list the, anything the specifically? The tinge of secularism and not, not the things that help you live a better Catholic life, just, I, would, I call it dribble, but that's not a very nice thing to say. Was there anything in particular about the faith that you, that made you have any, you know, red flags like this might not be Catholic? Is there anything that, was that there anything time, in particular? At that time, no, we were, we were, we were rather ostracized, it's true, because we were dressed in longer clothing. We didn't have habits yet at that time, but we were dressed in um, more modest clothing. And so the uh, school that was across the street, we lived right across the street practically from the school, high school, and uh, we would get things they would yell things at us as we were walking to the church. Someone burned our front lawn one night. You know, so who were these people filthy. that, and why were they doing that? We, we didn't know, we never knew anyone personally. Um, they, they threw apples at us as we were walking to the center to work. And one day an apple, I'm, we're talking big, big apple, just missed my head. I mean, I, I, felt the, I felt the air go by, so it did miss, but I don't know. Those were just little incidentals that it was like people could tell that we, we didn't really think the new was the best thing. You know, okay, so you knew that the there was have, you knew there yeah. were some changes. You didn't know what was going on. So when mm -hmm. when would you say that um, the CMRI or um, your superior? What happened when with the church? What were the what was it that made him oh, realize was, that there was a problem? What was it came to a head? First of all, we did take our first private vows. That's what it's very normal private vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience on October 7th of 1967. You might say, that's a short time. Well, we knew they were private vows. We weren't calling them canonical vows. And also we had had a very, very drilling formation on all three vows, very much hard line. I mean, the real, the strictest interpretation you can imagine, that's what we had. And so we'd done that. And then we left for the Fatima conference in, in Portland. And there was a little something there because the archbishop was offering the, I think probably a pontifical high mass at the end of this conference. And uh, he gave a sermon on people who are trying to be more Catholic than the church. It was a very strange insinuation that we all felt it. Um, I think he canceled the procession because it was raining. and We all probably, we were in the frame of mind in those days that we would have gone out in the rain to honor Our Lady. Not, I'm not saying that's good or bad at any rate. 
uh, we ended up feeling like we were walking away with our little dog between its tail between its legs. It was a, a very obvious thing. And, uh, and then at the end of this conference, it's something that I'll never forget. We're having a closing breakfast. Just the, mostly the priests were there that had been, that spoken. The, uh, the brothers were already gone because they had left on another pilgrimage in October to Our Lady of Fatima with a group of lay people, probably 30. So that was already arranged. So they're gone. We're going to drive home with a, a, a friend, get back to Coeur d'Alene. But we're having this breakfast, and I was sitting pretty close to the head table. I could hear them. And these priests were arguing about what came out that, or is coming out the next weekend, and it was already being spoken of. But there's this canon coming out, and they've actually changed the words of consecration. And one, I remember hearing things like one would say, that is going to invalidate the Mass. Oh, that's impossible. You, the church would never do that. Who so, said that? Who said this is prelates? Mother. These are priests or Monsignor, just, just people that In were the speakers diocese. at the conference. Okay. People that were invited. Father Rosito from uh, California was one of the names I remember. Father Bray may have been there, but I don't think it was. At any rate, these were conservative priests that were kind of, we knew they, they loved our Blessed Mother and they loved their faith. So, so they're arguing, and uh, you can tell it got string. One of them got up to leave, and as he was walking out, he said, you know, God bless you, Father. And, and someone says, uh, from the head table, someone said to him, keep the faith. And, and he looked back, and he said, don't. He said, no, spread the faith. In other words, he was, there was an argument that keep the faith might mean a little battle, and I'm here to spread the faith. I think there was a little division there already, right? In 1967, October and the 22nd of October is the day, which was a week later, that it was actually promulgated publicly. So that, that was a beginning. Now we go home and go, what do we do? Brothers aren't here. Four little 17, 18-year-olds with a rule to go to Mass every day. Mass every day was a block away. Just get out, go, be there. You know, we had a schedule. Well, the first time we went, uh, the priest turns around the canon and it's in English. That was the first. It wasn't in English before. And it's not even at all what our missiles say. So I'm not the superior of the four of us. So I'm just kneeling there thinking, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. But we stayed. But you know, one of our people that we knew already, that was a member of the cell group, he got up and he walked out. Walked out right after the priest started. And we know he went home. He was he was broken, a broken man. His wife said, honey, it had to be a mistake. He said, well, I, I hope so. so. He came back the next day, which we were there. The next day, he did not walk out. He kind of stomped out. He was so heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken. And anyway, we continued for, what was it, 10 days. And then when the brothers came home, they said, what? You've been going to that? And I, of course, you know, proud me. I could have told you so. <laughs> But that's not nice. And so they, so we never went again. So that was all. It was the, and this wasn't called the Novus Ordo. This was called the, um, these three choices, called the new anaphoras, three new anaphoras. I think that's how it was. So I don't know which one our, the priest was saying there, but the Novus Ordo then was to come a couple of years later and be way, way beyond. But still the words were changed. The words of consecration were changed. And from that time on, we had to have priests travel in because we didn't have any priests. So and we were very blessed to have a priest at the local Redemptorist order there. That's where we went to Mass. Saint, it's called St. Thomas. And he saw things like we did. So he would say the Latin Mass for us almost every day. We got Father Catherine was his name, a dear, dear man. And uh, eventually they, they shipped him out. To, and one of, one of the conservative Catholics took him in their home. And he died in the faith very, very ardently. But anyway, so we had to find priests to say mass. Sometimes it'd be six weeks we wouldn't have mass, sometimes longer. So all these changes that are happening, how did you, what were you thinking? With, was this all, did you, this wasn't obviously approved by the bishops, the local bishops. Did they find out that you had, a, that there was this group that oh. was doing private masses that weren't in line with yeah. their changes? It, they may have found that out, but the point was, they found out that we were not any longer going at all to the English and that we were saying it was wrong and that we weren't really connected. Um, we weren't connected with the with Rome in the sense of uh, Paul VI, because he's the one who issued it. 
And the point that we all agreed on was, how could a pope issue an invalid service and call it the mass? How could that happen? A true pope? It's impossible. So by, by uh, March of 1968, this was all around. And half the Blue Army from across the country who had cells, they, half of them quit. You know, we lost all kinds of people, all kinds of support. But we never went back on it, we never did. Uh, so I think that's pretty early for the traditionalist movement, did March you think, 1968. So did you think this was just something temporarily, just this little bit of chaos that, that was going to get resolved? Did you Were you thinking anything, like, you know, how is this going to get resolved? Or? You ask them, uh, I don't think we really had time to mull over that. We were so busy. People were moving to the area. We had catechism. We had the cells. So we had the bookstore to run, which was huge. And uh, we saw growth. So we're not really thinking, where else is it going to happen? I think we were a bit isolated more than maybe we should have been, maybe, but God allowed it. And uh, I don't remember thinking anything except, well, it looks like we're heading to the end because most of the people are following this. And we're kind of a, a sore spot. So that's something you do realize that uh, there's something collapsing. But the big picture... I don't think at that point it wasn't, but you know, as the years went on, of course, it became very, very clear. But wasn't your superior, um, Francis Schuchardt? Oh, Did yes, he was... that is true. That's probably a point that should be made. Francis Schuchardt was the Third Order Carmelite, along with Father Dennis Chicoin. They weren't, they weren't priests. They were brothers at that time, Third Order. So I'll call them brother, Brother Dennis and Brother Francis. And uh, uh, Brother Dennis had been a Marine you know, a week away, a month away from marriage, and told his bride, I'm sorry, I'm going to go serve Our Lady. And uh, so they were quite a, a pair. And really the, the bulk of the footwork was Father Dennis. Always, we always saw Father Dennis. Brother Francis was the, he had the dream. And he put you know, the, the whole thing, and he was a very ardent apostle. In fact, they had been touring the country on what you would call blitz tour schedules, a, a, con, a public lecture every night in a different hotel in a different city on the message of Fatima and what is happening to the Catholic Church or what has happened to the Catholic Church. Those were the titles. And that went on for a good three years after we were founded. And they were, they were very difficult. I was involved in arranging them. Six weeks, six weeks they'd be gone on these to try to tell. So you're talking about a very ardent, both of them, apostles of Our Lady of Fatima and of the Holy Catholic faith. And um, Brother Francis had an illness. Uh, in the end, he, he uh, I don't want to say fell away, but he, was, I think drugs took him out in the sense that he was on very, very heavy painkillers. And God knows, only God knows why the, the end of him, he actually ended up leaving, it was what, 1984, 1984. So that was 17, 17 years from our founding. And he ended up leaving because of the pressure. I mean, we were saying, if you, if these things are really true, what's being said about you, you, you we're, we're, you know, we can't be, have any part again with you. And it was a big, big thing. And we, we, we figure if we looked at it from heaven's viewpoint, we would see an absolute miracle that a whole congregation of about 500 people and what, 75 religious, a lot, that didn't follow him because we had seen the bizarre behavior and not coming to things, making us wait like a, eight hours for a mass. Wait, wait, wait. Things that were not, not human. So he, in other words, I don't know how to say it kindly because I don't, he's been long dead. And but he was one of the they, first ones to without him there would say not be, that this that, that we have no pope. Was he it, was. He, it, was it was brother brother Francis absolutely, and uh, without him there would not have been a CMRI. You know how religious orders are taken care of by God. Uh, I think that Our Lady he, he was an instrument, and when that instrumentality wasn't pulling the weight and being what it should be. She just transferred it over to Father Dennis, and then we we developed another more more uh, what's detailed rule and have elected father generals and mother generals ever since. So, but the fact that we still exist as CMRI is from our blessed mother. So this, the whole time that you were a sister, you kept on going and you, but you knew there was, um, you know, there was no person at the helm of the church. You knew, right. like, but you didn't understand. You had no 
idea how it was going to get resolved. Was there discussion? Yeah. Did you think that there was going to be some kind of end in sight? I mean, did you think that we were going to still be in this mess, you know, now? You know, because of the nature of Brother Francis, who then became Father Francis and Bishop Shukart, Bishop Francis Shukart, all of those, because of his, which turned out to be um, out of range, control, very exaggerated and very much not, not proper Catholic uh, religious obedience, for, so to say, us to him wasn't, it was a, an interpretation that was off the board of obedience. Things like that happened uh, and God allowed it because it, it strengthened us all. And it also showed us the dangers in the future of the Catholic traditional movement of some priest or brother or whatever in a little organization who becomes the all in all of everything, the final say of everything. And nobody has that today because we don't have a Pope. So we learned that lesson the hard way. And it's, it, we were glad to have it under our belt. Those are, though those were very hard days, we didn't, I, I was never asked to commit a sin. I was never put in an occasion of sin. And I always, always told our Blessed Mother, you know, if I'm ever told to do something that I think is wrong, I, I'm not going to do it. That was a big thing to say in those days. So speaking of obedience, you know, your congregation started under the local bishop. So mm -hmm. did you ever think that you were disobeying, you know, the hierarchy? Uh, did you, so you already understood that because he wasn't a Pope, that you weren't obliged to obey the, you know, the, the you know, the church authority yes. as, or you just thought, you already just knew that there was no. The whole meet. hierarchy went with the idea of Paul VI and the, and Mass and everybody going along with it. Um, and as far as Bishop Trinan goes, he did, I said, he made a visit to us and he just, he was courteous, but when he left, we were saying the Fatima prayers when he walked in, the children. And uh, when he left, he formalized his statement that we have been, our approval has been withdrawn. And at that point, we didn't think that meant anything because he's going along with the new, everything new. And, and we're not. So, but we really didn't have a lot of contact. Remember, there's no internet. There's nothing like that. And we only had the mail or a phone call. So... We had plenty to do. We still had a lot of people throughout the country that we sent mailings to, big, big mailing list. And uh, people moving, constantly moving to Coeur d'Alene. We had a school with 150 children in it by 19, I don't know, maybe 74, 72 even. But, so you know, there was a lot of life in our organization. It was big and it was the congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen. So it's still going. In the 70s, 80s, did well, it become more clear that your, you know, the decision that it, he's definitely is, this is a set of a conscious era, was it, it obviously becoming clearer and clearer? Oh, yes. And anybody who entered after 1970, 1970, they knew we were, we did not believe that these men that were sitting on the chair of Peter could possibly be popes. They knew that, everyone. So, uh, and that was just, a, that was a given. Um, and we began to be, become aware of more and more groups that were traditional. And we, I don't think we used the term set of a contest in the beginning. If we did, it was just amongst ourselves. It wasn't like in years to come, we were called set of a contest as if we started a new religion. And indeed you could meet people who would say, well, I, I don't believe in set of a contest. And I said, well, set of a contest is not a religion. It's a state of being. It means there's no one on the throne of Peter. That's all it means. We're Catholics, that's all we are. And uh, I would say that because of what CMRI went through with regards to the abuse of authority and things like that, the cult-like directives came down and the, the uh, final say in the person of one man, because of all that, we are um, very much more aware of such a thing again, but also we're never going to act like we're something and you're nothing. You know, you're wrong and we're right. We, we, we don't treat anyone like that. And we don't think that. We know we're trying to be true Catholics. We believe we are doing the best we can to be true Catholics, but it doesn't mean that someone else who doesn't see the same picture is going to be treated like, well, you're a heretic. No, we don't call people heretics. We try to bring them to the light. We try to be the light and bring them to the light to see that they have been deceived. And that's a great thing. We see it happening today even more than I think all my other 54 years in CMRI is astounding to see people call and say, do you have the Latin mass? 
And then, of course, I have to tell them, we have more than the Latin Mass. We have the Catholic faith. And that's, that's, the, that's what safeguards the Latin Mass, and the Latin Mass safeguards the Catholic faith. But we don't just have the Latin Mass because we like it. We have it because we believe it's the only true, only true Mass. The Holy Sacrifice of Calvary renewed in an unbloody manner on the altar. So uh, it, it's amazing how that kind of what goes around comes around because the growth that seems to be happening now more than ever as the mainstream goes more and more off the wall as far as anything that's defined as Catholic and little souls here and there who have waited now how many years since 1967 because it was painful. And there, I know an 80-year-old couple just called this week. Said, Our hearts have been broken, sister, for 40 years. We just don't know what to do. Can't find them. I'm so happy to hear you know, what you're telling me. We will be there. As soon as we get moved to Salem, we will be at church. Wonderful. So, so. is there anything else you'd like to add, sister, just to, you know, maybe about the blind obedience uh, that people have that maybe are keeping them inside the uh, confines of the Novus well, Ordo churches? There was another phrase that came up at the 1967 conference. Uh, and I will never forget it because it, it turns out to be an important one. It was, or, um, piety is no substitute for orthodoxy. Now, this is probably a quote from some distinguished Catholic. I don't know, but I, I heard it live, and that's all, all I know of its origin. Piety is no substitute for orthodoxy. And how true, because laity can be deceived by piety. A priest, and he may be in good faith. He may not be a real priest, but he may be in good faith. He may be the most pious, give the best sermons, and offer what he's trying to offer in the most pious manner. But the, the faith is what has to be the foundation. And if it isn't the foundation, piety doesn't make up, doesn't substitute for it. No, that doesn't mean that God may not look and say, this man is in perfect sincerity. I am going to lead him to the truth because he's really trying to do what's right. And I'm going to make sure he gets out of the error. That's why we would treat such a one with kindness. We wouldn't be saying, you're, you're, what a hypocrite. No, we, we don't call people names, ever. If anyone does, it's not, it's not from CMRI. So uh, hopefully um, that's a little But a little that's a lesson. good point because mm -hmm. people are influenced by mm -hmm. outward appearances, outward right. piety. And he's so know. nice, sister. He's so nice. He takes care of my children. He does, you know, everything. And they say, well, if the orders aren't valid, they're not valid. And piety doesn't make them valid. And that's a, that's a big issue in itself. But most of the, we're where we are. We're where we are today. And anybody that's really interested in seeing how in the world did we get here, they, they can do the research and find that all of these things fit into the puzzle. I think the other issue I would raise is the uh, role of true devotion to Mary by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Because... Um, the brothers actually discovered that shortly after we came together. And uh, we began to prepare. We prepared for three months to take the consecration to Our Lady. And that consecration is like an umbrella over our vows. They are, they are like on equal weight because we've given all to her. And she is, she is our queen and our mother and our model, our mistress. And uh, that... That consecration has always been our flag, our flagship. We're, we're slaves of Mary. So one of the things we've ever get deeply into conversation with someone, especially from a foreign country, we say, do you know about St. Louis de Montfort? I was on a plane a couple of years ago. And the, the steward was really wanting a rosary and a scapular. And he, he talked like he really was a Catholic. So I went back to the, what do you call it? Where they, where they wait, where they sit down and wait. And I said, Dad, have you ever heard of St. Louis de Montfort? St. Louis de Montfort, and I said, total slave or something. And he said, St. Louis de Montfort? I'm a slave of Mary. Yes, I've been one for 10 years or whatever. And then we got to talk about that. And he had given his scapular to a, a doctor who was dying. He said, this is very timely because I need a scapular. We just gave it to him two days ago. And I need, need a scapular. Um, so uh, then we discovered the Path of Mary by Mother Mary Potter, which is another, another picture of holy slavery. But it, the, the uh, tribute has to go huge for our congregation to Our Lady. We count her as our foundress. We don't name a founder because of what happened, 
and we say, who founded your congregation? Our, bla our Blessed Mother did, and we really believe that. We wouldn't be here if she didn't intervene in that crisis. That was a huge crisis. You can't even imagine. And all these people stood up and said, yes, we're going to stay with the faith and what's what, what Brother Dennis stands for. You know, Father, he was Father Dennis at that time. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a crumbling of faith. So there was, there was an element of cult there, but not to the degree where every person individually, in fact, very few were followers of the person of uh, Shukart, very few. And we, most of the people were solid and it's about being a Catholic, that's what it's about. And that's why we're, we're still here. So was there anything in particular, what were, there, what were the actual things that made you think, this is a miss, this isn't Catholic, and you knew for sure, like you just could not go and attend the mm -hmm. the new mass or that church. Right. Well, I was already in the convent, and that was the promulgation of the first three anaphoras in October 1967. And there were several priests, and there were even bishops that were very troubled by that. And we weren't the only ones, but as, as a sister, of course, I didn't know how many there were, but there were priests that were. They cut off right then, not going to say that it's not right. And uh, so our superior, who at that time was, was uh, Brother Francis, also said, this is not right, it's not valid, and we're not going to go. That's huge. We stopped going to St. Thomas Church. We had to find a place. We drove three hours in the morning to be at a 7 o'clock mass somewhere in Idaho, no, in northern Washington state, and uh, really was a huge shaking of your life uh, so far as what next, what next. And the fact of the mass having been changed, we all told our families, you know, you got to look at this. This is wrong. This is, uh, this translation is so off the wall. So you knew it was off the know. wall. You knew it wasn't Catholic. Your Catholic sense mm -hmm. obviously told you you couldn't go, but how did that, did you have any, conf any confliction with, well, this is the Pope. We have to obey him. I think the question from the beginning was very clear to all of us, and that is, he can't be the Pope. I had a good Catholic education, and so did many of the early sisters and brothers, and the Pope is infallible, and he cannot err in matters of faith or morals. There's nothing more vital to that solidity of faith and morals than the holy sacrifice of the Mass to issue something called, whatever they called it, but Catholics still thought it was the Mass, and it is completely changed. It's not an adaptation of uh, putting the English in front of everybody instead of the Latin. There's hardly any relationship between. So that just severed the whole idea. And it was a shock uh, to all of us, but we, we were together in it. We, we had come through the, through the river, so to speak, because we, we were together for, what, six months before that realization was really solid. And there was no, no question about it in my mind ever because it, to question, to say, no, he could be, then he's, he's destroying the faith of all these people and destroying the worship, the true worship of God. And, and we, you're supposed to call him Pope. That isn't what a Pope is. So in my mind, it was as easy as that. What is a Pope? What is his role? And what did our Lord give him as divine protection so that he could not ever lead the church astray? This man is doing those three things or however I led up to that. And therefore, there is no way he can be the Pope. You obviously didn't know what the repercussions were going to be. No. Um, and you just knew instinctively you did not have to obey him. You did not, right. you did not have to obey him. Well, he's but, not the Pope, so there's no, there's no allegiance whatsoever. And uh, yes, it, it, the feeling was, uh, you're really, really wrong, all of you. You know, this little band of religious and laity in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and throughout the country, the little cells that we were connected with. Um, so that began what we, we, us Catholics, we all know can come to us in our lifetime, and that is uh, persecution. You're labeled. Boy, we were labeled. All kinds of them, and it's not fun, but when you know that Christ was labeled, and he stuck to the truth of his mission, you know, right, right before he's going to be scourged, he's telling Pilate, I am here to bear witness to the truth. That was, that was one of the lines that sent Pilate said, I'm just going to scourge him, he's to whatever. So we're here to bear witness to the truth, no matter how much it's hated, how much people don't uh, want to have it be part of their lives. That doesn't change the truth. And if the truth is what really sets you free. You will find that traditional Catholics are 
basically very happy people. Because even though we may be hated by millions, we know that we're striving to please God and that he wins. In the end, truth wins. It doesn't fail. Well, we know our, the, the Immaculate Heart will triumph in the end. That and the, I will... I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head with her heel. And our Lord's words to his apostles, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not means never. When did you realize that these were, that there was, there was actually a setup, a, a false church? When did it, when did, it was obviously a gradual thing where you realized this was, I think God protected us from calling it a false church because who were we to make that statement? But it's, it's only been in the last, what, 15, 20 years to, that we'd actually make a blanket distinction. Don't even call it and don't stand up and say, the Catholic church is just being controlled and, and it's just going to, into heresy every day. It can't be the Catholic church then. If you have to say that about a church, it cannot be the Catholic church because it can't happen. A person can, can be an error, uh, a bishop can be an error, but a pope cannot teach error. He can't lead his flock into error, and especially give them an invalid mass. So what is the role of Archbishop Took in your congregation? Well, after the break in 1984, we call it the break because that's when Bishop Schuchart left, uh, we were looking for a bishop. And through uh, Bishop George Musey, who was in Louisiana, we learned of, now I'm not sure of the exact line of this because I wasn't the secretary anymore. I had been secretary of the congregation for many years. And uh, we learned of Archbishop Took in, uh, he was in France at the time. And he had, he had consecrated four priests in this country, bishops. So Bishop George Musi was one of them. And through him, we have the line preserved in all of our priests because we made sure that the ordination was valid and from a valid line. Absolutely, no question, valid line. Some research people might want to do that see this on Archbishop Took and they will find that it is very absolute certain, the uh, validity of his line. And it turns out that he's one of the only bishops who was at Vatican II. Maybe signed the documents, but rescinded it within very short time completely said, I do, I deny, or I, what do you call it? I reverse that. I want my name taken off. And he was literally left alone. He didn't get back to Vietnam because you know what state Vietnam was in in those years. So he had a little hut, so to speak, in Rome. He was very poor. And uh, people started finding him because he was saying the Latin mass. And eventually he ended up in France. And eventually he began to realized that he had the line and he consecrated bishops. And that's where the consecration of our current bishop, Mark Piperunas, who is stationed in Omaha, Nebraska, and has a, an international apostolate of the Catholic faith and of being what a bishop is to be for his flock. Um, that is where he drew his orders from. Archbishop Took to Bishop Musi to Bishop uh, Carmona to Bishop Piverunas. I think Bishop Carmona, I have to back that up. Archbishop took to Bishop Carmona of Mexico to Bishop Mark Piverunas. And when was Bishop Mark Piverunas? 1991, I believe. Mm -hmm. So up to that time, <clears throat> who was the, before that happened, who was the, you know, the superior of um, the CMRI? Father Dennis functioned all up until then as the, and he was even the superior general for the most part through those years from 1984 till at least from 1986, we had our first elections, 1986 to uh, 19, I, I forget, he died in 1995 and he had been, uh, Bishop Mark Kavrunas had been elected superior general years prior to that. Uh, so, the, but the line of Bishop, Archbishop Took is, to me, it's a saving grace of the Catholic. He, he plays a pivotal role in the retaining of the uh, episcopacy. You have to have a bishop. So. 
So sister, now fast forward 2020, 2021, um, you know, what is your life like now as a Simurai nun? You mean individually? Individually, yes. Well, in 2005, we began a little mission in East Boston, Massachusetts. And I was stationed there, never thinking I would be a missionary sister. So we lived there for 10 years, um, running a little chapel in the basement of the home. Uh, the convent was on the third floor, and we had a chapel in the, in the basement. And we had quite a congregation by the time we moved, but we were having mass in rental halls, you know, renting a, a space somewhere for mass. We never had a church, and it was always our dream. You know, you have to have a church. God's house is so important. We never did. So in 10 years, we moved up to uh, Salem, New Hampshire. And uh, during that time, during the move and after we, Sister Mary Inez is my companion here in uh, New Hampshire. And we had been searching for a church. She was on, you know, on the web, finding out what's for sale, where. And that went on for, I think, a good mm, four or five months. And one day she spotted this one, 290 Main Street in Salem. We came to see it, Sandy and the realtor. And from the time we walked down the first steps, we knew that was it. So that was in 2015. 15? 2015. Yes, we moved in uh, the basement in November of 2015. And by March, we had the upstairs, the sanctuary, very much completed, beautiful sanctuary. And the, our, all of our own people working on it. Uh, and we had our dedication with Bishop Peperunis on the 2nd of March, 2016. So then we have gone along for three years, come 2019, I guess you'd have to say four years, 2020. And um, something happened in February or March, it had to do with uh, people staying home and churches being closed and, and all this. So the initial word was that there would be no mass for a week or two. That was the initial word. And one of the parishioners said we could do the floors. And that was the beginning of a movement to really renovate, make this church up to date because it is run down. It needs a lot of work. So since March of this year, of last year, 2020, uh, the floors were all, you know, sanded down. It was a mammoth three-week three, three week project. And from there, we began to realize that, you know, the cues are all out. Everything's over. Why don't we do the walls and the ceiling? You shouldn't, you know, if you put everything back in, you're going to waste a lot of work. And so it just grew from one thing to another. The whole nave is completely redone beautifully. And, um, and then we even realized that the driveway is so bad, we're going to have broken legs and broken arms out there if we have another winter with that mess because it's so muddy and then frozen and then icy and all these things. So we actually have half of the paving job done at this point and will be finished in the spring. But that's not the most important part. The most important part is that from that week when we closed, we're going to be closed for two weeks to start the floors, we started growing with people. A family of six, and then a, a, a couple here, a couple there, uh, a family of eight, a family of uh, three. It, it's been amazing. And we actually doubled our, our numbers in the last uh, 10 months. During all this time, you all know what 2020 held. So that's quite remarkable that now we're going to start a little catechism with the children. And uh, we, we always have a, a, a catechism, an adult catechism, once a month. But uh, this is something new. We have many children, and it looks like there, well, there are more on the way. <laughs> that's obvious. So what is the uh, main thing that you and Sister Inez do as, um, in, as missionary sisters here? It's too many things really to mention. Sister is now doing a, a weekly email of, of inspiration and education in, in Catholic, more devotion than doctrine. I work more on the, the, uh, the doctrine side, preparing a class that has to do with the doctrines of the faith. Um, I spend a good time of my day doing, I have to say paperwork because it's letters and it's emails. So I just call it emails, paperwork, and then it's phone calls. And I can have an, an agenda all set up for the day. I'm going to finish all of these cards today. And I get a phone call. And I, people say, I know you're busy. No, I'm here for you. Let me see what we can do. And uh, that's the truth. 
And sometimes I don't even get to the point one of what I was going to do that day, but it's all about souls. It's, it's really is uh, sending. We send a lot of things out to people. So could you please send me one of those? Could you please? Have, we're not a mail order uh, mission, but it ends up you have, who else do you ask to do that? You know? And of course we have a bookstore and the, the um, gift shop, which behind, behind, behind. And yet, People that come and look at our bookstore say, you have some of the best books I've ever seen. So I think, again, I have to point up Blessed Mother. Somehow she just inspires us when to get more books and what books to get. And uh, I, mean, I think they're pretty great, too, myself, but I don't take any credit for it. I haven't read them all. Thank you, sister. So it's been a pleasure, a privilege speaking with you and hearing your story, your firsthand story and account of what it was like to be living through the changes and how you um, how you acted and you know how you would you know what to do it was just um inspiring to hear like just that you had the faith and you just knew that you couldn't yes. continue along and follow those changes and um it's amazing it's a long time ago and you have been the heart of our mission so uh it's just been a pleasure having you here thank you so much it's my it, it's my honor but it's i'm unworthy of it i'm grateful to be here